Hey you, come here, I gotta tell you a secret. Home servers don't have to be big and or loud machines. That's right, I said it. Having a home server doesn't mean you have to have some big bulky desktop machine or a probably also bulky and loud blade server that sits in a server rack. Home servers can be tiny and, dare I say it, sexy. Exhibit A. Take a look at this. And yes, it's a fully functioning home server. Let's talk about it. Okay, so if you're looking at this and it looks familiar, that is because I have used this case in a previous video and I will applaud you for watching some of my other videos and recognizing this. But this is the Inwin Chopin, as I have been corrected on that other video on its pronunciation. It's a mini ITX case that comes with a built-in 180 watt, I believe, power supply. And I used it previously for a mini Ryzen 5700G build, and I figured why not build a home server in it? So that's what I did. Now you're probably looking at this case and thinking, well, I can't really tell how big that really is because you could be a giant person or a super tiny person, so it's hard to tell. Luckily, I have a measuring device right here that transcends both the Imperial and the metric system. A banana. So height-wise, you're looking at like 1.2 bananas uh, width. What's that? Like two bananas width. And depth, that's like, that's like a solid one banana. So there's your measurements. So let's take it apart and I will show you the insides of it while I explain the parts I used and why. So for the processor, we are running a Intel Xeon E3-1240LB3. The reason I went with this is because it's a four core, eight thread CPU. It has a base clock of two gigahertz. It can boost to three, which is fine for, you know, a smaller home server like this. And the cool thing about the L version is that it's only got a 25 watt TDP. So this is going to be quite power efficient. If we take a look inside, you will see the CPU cooler is similar to the one I used before. This is the Noctua NH L9i. It's a low profile cooler that is more than adequate for a low TDP chip like this. So you notice I have two sticks of RAM. This is two eight gigabyte sticks, so 16 gigabytes of DDR3 1600 mega transfers per second. I got comments in the other video that you know, don't say megahertz, it's not actually megahertz, it's transfers per second, and the frequency is actually half. So 1600 mega transfers, 1600 megahertz, as many people will say, but that's the speed, and this is ECC unbuffered RAM. Now, that is because I made the mistake and purchased registered ECC memory, come to find out that the processor is not able to use ECC registered RAM. So I had to go with unbuffered and that's fine. Now the motherboard is an interesting piece of this because it's a Chinese board. It's from the same brand that I've used previously on my budget server build. I will link that video here, but it is a Jinyu board. And it's cool because it's an H95 chipset. So it allows for older processors, which means you can buy some cheaper ones off eBay. This one was about $80, but the cool thing is that it also supports NVMe. So you can see here, I have a 256 gigabyte NVMe drive that I am using to boot my operating system on. But this board will support Xeon E3 processors as well as uh, desktop i3 to i7 from Intel's 4000 series, as well as some Pentium processors from the G3000 series. So you have quite a lot of CPU options for this motherboard. Now around the back, you get pretty standard IO, you get USB 3.0 uh, gigabit LAN, and you know obviously USB 2.0 and your regular HD audio, nothing special. Now you're probably thinking, well, 256 gigabytes, I mean, that's fine for a boot drive, but that's not really a lot of storage space if you wanna do some actual home server stuff. Don't worry, I got you. So around the back here, we have two hard drives. Now these aren't SSDs, they are laptop hard drives. That's why they are in this 2.5 inch form factor. And the reason I went with that is because SSDs, while they have come down in price, they're still not as cheap as hard drives, even if you get these laptop ones. So I have two, two terabyte drives here and they cost about 
60-ish dollars each. So we get about four terabytes of raw storage or around 120, 130 dollars. Not bad. And I think that's the gist of the build. There's not really much else to talk about. One thing to note is that if you do go with one of these Jinyu boards, both the one I've got before and this one do not come with the battery for the motherboard. So make sure you have one of those. Okay, let's put it back together and I will show you what I am running on it. All right, let's plug her in. While it boots up, um, one thing you may have noticed if you're a nerd is that I'm using an Intel E3 Xeon processor, which does not have onboard graphics. So to get an operating system installed on it, you either have to do a headless install or you can go with my way and plug in a riser card to a tiny little GPU. So that's what I did. Just ran this directly into the motherboard, set the GPU on my desk, and I had a GUI to install Proxmox, which is what we are running as the host operating system for this server. Another thing is that I initially planned on using TrueNAS Scale for this video because I really wanted to try it out. Um, it's still in beta. It's TrueNAS's new hypervisor version based on Linux. and I just really did not have a good time with it, so I scrapped that and went with Proxmox. I do see the potential in TrueNAS scale. The app store that they have is clean and has a lot of potential, and I like it much better than Proxmox's uh, Linux containers that they use. But I just had so much trouble doing the basic stuff in there in terms of you know what a regular hypervisor is supposed to do, like installing apps, installing VMs and containers. It just wasn't a pleasurable experience. I was getting errors just trying to install a VM. I wasn't able to edit it. It might have been due to the headless nature of my system, but it, it just wasn't a good time. So I'll let all the smarter people uh, handle using the beta and submitting and fixing the bugs on that before we revisit it. Okay, so here we are in Proxmox, and uh, the first thing I did was configure my hard drives. Now you can set up basic NAS functionality within Proxmox um, and set up shares and whatnot, but we're not gonna do any of that. We set up a simple ZFS configuration um, with those two hard drives now. We went into our host, uh, went down to disks. You'll see that uh, both of my hard disks are partitioned and using ZFS. And here's my ZFS pool. We get two terabytes of total storage because I have them mirrored. Now you don't have to mirror your hard drives. You can just have them running without any type of RAID configuration at all. Maybe you like living life on the edge. Maybe you're the type of person that needs like six cups of coffee or to kill a person to wake up in the morning. I don't know, I'm not gonna judge you. But that's our configuration for storage. Um, another thing I want to note is that in TrueNAS scale, there's no default option to utilize the rest of your boot drive. So for example, I was running it off of that 256 gigabyte NVMe drive. Now, TrueNAS scale takes what, like 15 gigs? The rest of the 200 plus gigabytes on that NVMe drive weren't noticed by the operating system. Now there is a way around it. I'll link a Reddit thread down below. Um, for services running, I'm not running anything crazy. I have SyncThing running as a Linux container as well as Nextcloud in a Linux container and then a Windows 10 VM. So Linux containers are cool because they're basically the templates, kind of the app store for Proxmox. So the way you install those is you actually go into your storage where you have the CT templates option. Go to templates, and this is where you kind of have a list of all the different services you can just spin up relatively quickly. Now you have to download these, but it's, it's one click. So you can scroll through here, and if you see anything that tickles your fancy, uh, just hit download. And once that's complete, um, you'll see your list of downloaded services here. Now, if you don't see a large list like I have, you may have to update your list. And that's pretty simple. Go into your shell for your host and just run PVE AM update. And that's gonna update your list of templates. Now mine's already updated, but um, once you do that, you should see a larger list. And once you do that, it's similar to installing a VM. Just click over here, create CT, 
uh, instead of create VM and it'll take you through the whole process. It's very similar. I'm not gonna walk through that. Um, there's many tutorials and videos out there on how to do it and it's really basic anyway. So sync thing, I have sync thing running. I've done a video on sync thing. It's what I use primarily as my backup. I will link that video there. That's a good use case for this. It can run as your backup server. It sips very little power and you can get a decent amount of storage in it like I showed before. Same thing with Nextcloud. Um, I have Nextcloud here. You can see it is actually exposed to the internet. Now I have a video on that. I just put it out. That'll be linked up here if you want to learn how to expose your services and websites to the outside world using proper HTTPS and SSL encryption. Check that video out. Nextcloud sync thing. And I, like I said before, I have a Windows 10 VM running. My password is password, fight me. And we've assigned uh, eight gigs of RAM to this and uh, four threads. And you can see in our summary that everything is running pretty fine. We've used just a little over half of our RAM usage. CPU is running at about up to 15% at idle, but mostly sits in the low numbers because it's not really doing anything right now. Which brings me to my next point, which is power draw, which I know is an important thing when talking about home servers because nobody wants to chunk a server in their corner that's pulling 500 watts. So in this case, I went in with the idea of trying to get this as a low power system. And I think we did that. So at idle, this sips only about 21 watts, which is pretty awesome. Now I actually have it plugged in. So let's take a look over here. It is actually pulling 19.8 right now. And when I'm actually using it, it does get up to around 31 and under heavy use cases over 50. But for a lot of home servers, idle power is important. And this one is pretty efficient. Use cases for something like this, it can be whatever you want it to be. I mean, just because it's small doesn't mean it has to be your backup system. It can be your production system. It doesn't matter. So whatever you want it to be, go for it. Now, obviously it was designed to be a low power system. So this isn't going to be a rendering machine or a cloud gaming server or anything. But luckily a lot of things out there don't require much processing power. So make this a Plex server, make it a next cloud server, make it a backup server, turn it around, put it on your face. I don't, I don't care. Do whatever you want with it. So one thing though that you can't do with this specific build is have it as kind of your media PC. I know a lot of people use uh, small form factor builds as their media PCs, but with this not having integrated graphics, uh, you can't really do that very well. But luckily this board, like I said before, supports you know those i3 to i7 4000 series Intel chips with dedicated graphics built in. So if you wanna go with that, go with that. And I actually have somewhere an Intel i7 4700 that I will be using in this board in the future for a project that I'm actually really excited about. I will show kind of a teaser over my face right now, I guess, of what it's gonna be. And I'm super excited for those parts to come in and that's gonna be a fun one. So that's it. There's really no major points to this video. I just wanted to show off that you can have a small home server with all the bells and whistles, like you know a decent amount of cores, ECC, RAM, low power in a small form factor case. Let me know down in the comments what you're running. Are you running a big Chungus server, which I also am as my production server? Or are you running Blade servers? Or are you running something tiny like this? Let me know down in the comments. But if you like this video, be sure to drop a like. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you are interested in other projects that I have coming up, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss those. And I will see you in the next one.